tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 12, Episode 3. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of classic author Joseph Sheridan Le Fan. Tonight you'll hear tales of unseen assailants, voices demanding to be heard, requests for revenge, and mentions of madness. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now... It's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> mm. Why tempt fate? The place is reputed as haunted. What's the point, indeed? Trying to prove otherwise, in the event it actually is? Well, in a boarding house in New York, a few tenants are about to prove true that what you can't see can hurt you. Without further ado, I present to you... What was it? It is, I confess with considerable diffidence, that I approached the strange narrative which I'm about to relate. The events which I purpose detailing are of so extraordinary a character that I'm quite prepared to meet with an unusual amount of incredulity and scorn. I accept all such beforehand. I have, I trust, the literary courage to face unbelief. I have, after mature consideration, Resolved to narrate, in as simple and straightforward a manner as I can compass, some facts that passed under my observation in the month of July last, and which, in the annals of the mystery of physical science, are wholly unparalleled. I live at a house in 26th Street in New York. The house is in some respects a curious one. It has enjoyed, for the last two years, the reputation of being haunted. The house is very spacious. A hall of noble size leads to a large spiral staircase winding through its center, while the various apartments are of imposing dimensions. It was built some fifteen or twenty years since by a well-known New York merchant, who, five years ago, threw the commercial world into convulsions by a stupendous bank fraud. He, as everyone knows, escaped to Europe and died not long after of a broken heart. Almost immediately after the news of his decease reached this country and was verified, the report spread in 26th Street 
that my abode was haunted. Legal measures had dispossessed the widow of its former owner, and it was inhabited merely by a caretaker and his wife, placed there by the house agent into whose hands it had passed for purposes of renting or sale. These people declared that they were troubled by unnatural noises. Doors were opened without any visible agency. The remnants of furniture scattered through the various rooms were, during the night, piled upon the other by unknown hands. Invisible feet passed up and down the stairs in broad daylight, accompanied by the rustle of unseen silk dresses and the gliding of viewless hands along the massive balusters. The caretaker and his wife declared they would no longer live there. The house agent laughed, dismissed them, and put others in their place. Noises and supernatural manifestations continued. The neighborhood caught up the story, and the house remained untenanted for three years. Several persons negotiated for it, but somehow, always before the bargain was closed, they heard the unpleasant rumors and declined to treat any further. It was in this state of things that my landlady, who at the time kept a boarding house in Bleecker Street, and who wished to move farther uptown, conceived the bold idea of renting 26th Street out. Happening to have in her house rather a plucky and philosophical set of boarders, she laid her scheme before us, stating candidly everything she had heard respecting the ghostly qualities of the establishment to which she wished to remove us. With the exception of two timid persons, a sea captain, and a returned Californian, who immediately gave notice that they would leave, all of Mrs. Moffat's guests declared that they would accompany her in her incursion into the abode of spirits. Our removal was effected in the month of May, and we were charmed with our new residence. Of course, we had no sooner established ourselves than we began to expect the ghosts. We absolutely awaited their advent with eagerness. Our dinner conversations were supernatural. I found myself a person of immense importance, it having leaked out that I was tolerably well-versed in the history of supernaturalism, and had once written a story, the foundation of which was a ghost. If a table or wainscot panel happened to warp when we were assembled in the large drawing room, was an instant silence, and every one was prepared for an immediate clanking of chains in a spectral form. After a month of psychological excitement, it was with the utmost dissatisfaction that we were forced to acknowledge that nothing in the remotest degree approaching the supernatural had manifested itself. Things were in this state when an accident took place so awful and inexplicable in its character that my reason fairly reels at the bare memory of the occurrence. It was the 10th of July. After dinner was over, I repaired with my friend, Dr. Hammond, to the garden to smoke my evening pipe. Independent of certain mental sympathies which existed between the doctor and myself, we were linked together by a vice. We both smoked opium. We knew each other's secret and respected it. We enjoyed together that wonderful expansion of thought, that marvelous intensifying of the perspective faculties, that boundless feeling of existence when we seem to have points of contact with the whole universe. In short, that unimaginable spiritual bliss, which I would not surrender for a throne, which I hope you, reader, will never, never taste. On the evening in question, the 10th of July, the doctor and myself drifted into an unusually metaphysical mood. We lit our large meerschaums filled with fine Turkish tobacco, in the core of which burned a little black nut of opium that, like the nut in the fairy tale held within its narrow limits, wanders beyond the reach of kings. We paced to and fro, conversing. A strange perversity dominated the currents of our thoughts. They would not flow through the sunlit channels into which we strove to divert them. For some unaccountable reason, they constantly diverged into dark and lonesome beds, where a continual gloom brooded. 
It was in vain that, after our old fashion, we flung ourselves on the shores of the East and talked about its gay bazaars, of the splendors of the time of harem, of harems and golden palaces. Black of freights continually arose from the depths of our talk and expanded like the one the fishermen released from the copper vessel until they bloated everything bright from our vision. Insensibly, we yielded to the occult force that swayed us and indulged in gloomy speculation. We had talked some time upon the proneness of the human mind to mysticism and the almost universal love of the terrible, when Hammond suddenly said to me, What do you consider to be the greatest element of terror? The question puzzled me. That many things were terrible, I knew. But it now struck me for the first time that there must be one great and ruling embodiment of fear, the king of terrors, which all others must succumb. What might it be? To what train of circumstances would it owe its existence? I confessed, Hammond, I replied to my friend, I never considered the subject before, that there must be one something more terrible than any other thing, I feel. I cannot attempt, however, even the most vague definition. I'm somewhat like you, Harry, he answered. I feel my capacity to experience a terror greater than anything yet conceived by the human mind, something combining in fearful and unnatural amalgamation hitherto supposed incompatible elements. The calling of the voices in Brockton Brown's novel of Wheeland was awful. So is the picture of the dweller on the threshold in Bulwer's Zanoni. But, he added, shaking his head gloomily, there is something more horrible still than these. Look here, Hammond, I rejoined. Let us drop this kind of talk, for heaven's sake shall suffer for it, depend on it. I don't know what's the matter with me tonight, he replied, but my brain is running on all sorts of weird novel thoughts. I feel as if I could write a story like Hoffman tonight, if I were only master of a literary style. Well, if we're going to be Hoffman-esque in our talk, I'm off to bed. Opium and nightmares should never be brought together. Oh, sultry it is. Good night, Hammond. Good night, Harry. Pleasant dreams to you. To you, gloomy wretch, afreets, ghouls, and enchanters. We parted, and each sought his respective chamber. I undressed quickly and got into bed, taking with me, according to my usual custom, a book over which I generally read myself to sleep. I opened the volume as soon as I laid out my head upon a pillow, and instantly flung it to the other side of the room. It was Gowden's History of Monsters, a curious French work which I had lately imported from Paris, but which, in the state of mind I had reached, was anything but an agreeable companion. I resolved to go to sleep at once, so, turning down my gas until nothing but a little blue point of light glimmered on the top of the tube, I composed myself to rest. The room was in total darkness. The atom of gas that still remained alight did not illuminate a distance of three inches around the burner. I desperately drew my arm across my eyes as if to shut out even the darkness and tried to think of nothing. It was in vain. The confounded themes touched on by Hammond in the garden kept obtruding themselves on my brain. I battled against them. I erected ramparts of would-be blankness of intellect to keep them out. They still crowded upon me. While I was lying, still as a corpse, hoping that by a perfect physical inaction I would hasten mental repose, an awful incident occurred. A something dropped, as it seemed, from the ceiling, plumb upon my chest, and the next instant I felt two bony hands circling my throat, endeavoring to choke me. I'm no coward, and am possessed of considerable physical strength. The suddenness of the attack, instead of stunning me, strung every nerve to its highest tension. My body acted from instinct, 
before my brain had time to realize the terrors of my position. In an instant, I wound two muscular arms around the creature and squeezed it with all the strength of despair against my chest. In a few seconds, the bony hands that had fastened on my throat loosened their hold, and I was free to breathe once more. Then commenced a struggle of awful intensity. Immersed in the most profound darkness, totally ignorant of the nature of the thing by which I was so suddenly attacked. Finding my grasp slipping every moment by reason, it seemed to me, of the entire nakedness of my assailant, bitten with sharp teeth in the shoulder, neck, and chest, having every moment to protect my throat against a pair of sinewy agile hands, which my utmost efforts could not confine, these were a combination of circumstances to combat, which required all the strength, skill, and courage that I possessed. At last, after a silent, deadly, exhausting struggle, I got my assailant under by a series of incredible efforts of strength. Once pinned with my knee on what I made out to be its chest, I knew that I was victor. I rested for a moment to breathe. I heard the creature beneath me panting in the darkness, and felt the violent throbbing of a heart. It was apparently as exhausted as I was. That was one comfort. At this moment, I remembered that I usually placed under my pillow before going to bed a large yellow silk pocket handkerchief. I felt for it instantly. It was there. A few seconds more I had, after a fashion, pinioned the creature's arm. I now felt tolerably secure. There was nothing more to be done but to turn on the gas, and, having first seen what my midnight assailant was like, Arouse the household. I will confess to being actuated by a certain pride in not giving the alarm before. I wish to make the capture alone and unaided. Never losing my hold for an instant, I slipped from the bed to the floor, dragging my captive with me. I had but a few steps to make to reach the gas burner. These I made with the greatest caution, holding the creature in a grip like a vice. At last I got within arm's length of the tiny speck of blue light which told me where the gas burner lay. Quick as lightning, I released my grasp with one hand and let on the full flood of light. Then I turned to look at my captive. I cannot even attempt to give any definition of my sensations the instant after I turned on the gas. I suppose I must have shrieked with terror for in less than a minute afterward my room was crowded with the inmates of the house. I shudder now as I think of that awful moment. I saw nothing. Yes, I had one arm firmly clasped round a breathing, panting, corporal shape. My other hand gripped with all its strength, the throat as warm and apparently fleshy as my own, and yet, with this living substance in my grasp, with its body pressed against my own, and all in the bright glare of a large jet of gas, I absolutely beheld nothing. Not even an outline, a vapor. I do not, even at this hour, realize the situation in which I found myself. I cannot recall the astounding incident thoroughly. Imagination in vain tries to compass the awful paradox. It breathed felt its warm breath upon my cheek. It struggled fiercely. It had hands. They clutched me. Its skin was smooth like my own. There it lay, pressed close up against me, solid as stone, and yet utterly invisible. I wonder that I didn't faint or go mad on the instant. Some wonderful instinct must have sustained me absolutely, in place of loosening my hold on the terrible enigma, seemed to gain an additional strength in my moment of horror, and tightened my grasp with such wonderful force that I felt the creature shivering with agony. Just then, Hammond entered my room at the head of the household. As soon as he beheld my face, which I suppose must have been an awful sight to look at, he hastened forward, crying, "'Great heaven!' What has happened? Hammond, Hammond, I cried. Come here. Oh, this is awful. I've been attacked in bed by something or other, which I have hold of, but I can't see it. 
I can't see it. Hammond, doubtless struck by the unfeigned horror expressed in my countenance, made one or two steps forward with an anxious yet puzzled expression, a very audible bitter burst from the remainder of my visitors. This suppressed laughter made me furious. To laugh at a human being in my position, it was the worst species of cruelty. Now I can understand why the appearance of the man struggling violently, as it would seem, with an airy nothing and calling for assistance against a vision, would have appeared ludicrous. Then, so great was my rage against the mocking crowd that had I the power, I would have struck them dead where they stood. Hammond! Hammond! I cried again, despairingly. For God's sakes, come to me. I can hold the, the thing but a short while longer. It's overpowering me. Help me! Help me! Harry! whispered Hammond, approaching me. You've been smoking too much opium. I swear to you, Hammond, that this is no vision. I answered in the same low tone. Don't you see how it shakes my whole frame with its struggles? If you don't believe me, convince yourself. Feel it. Touch it. Hammond advanced and laid his hand in the spot I indicated. A wild cry of horror burst from him. He had felt it. In a moment, he had discovered somewhere in my room a long piece of cord and was the next instant winding it and knotting it around the body of the unseen being that I clasped in my arms. Harry, he said in a hoarse, agitated voice, for though he preserved his presence of mind, he was deeply moved. Harry, it's all safe now. You may let go, old fellow, if you're tired. The thing can't move. I was utterly exhausted, and I gladly lose my hold. Hammond stood holding the ends of the cord that bound the invisible, twisted round his hand, while before him, self-supporting as it were, he beheld a rope laced and interlaced and stretching tightly around a vacant space. I never saw a man look so thoroughly stricken with awe. Nevertheless, his face expressed all the courage and determination which I knew him to possess. His lips, although white, were firmly set, and one could perceive at a glance that, although stricken with fear, he was not daunted. The confusion that ensued among the guests of the house, who were witnesses of this extraordinary scene between Hammond and myself, who beheld the pantomime of binding this struggling something, beheld me almost sinking from physical exhaustion when my task of jailer was over, the confusion and terror that took possession of the bystanders, when they all saw this, it was beyond description. The weaker ones fled from the apartment. A few who remained clustered near the door and could not be induced to approach Hammond and his charge. Still, incredulity broke out through their terror. They had not the courage to satisfy themselves, and yet they doubted. It was in vain that I begged of some of the men to come near and convince themselves, by touch of the existence in that room, of a living being which was invisible. They were incredulous, but did not dare to undeceive themselves. Could a solid, living, breathing body be invisible, they asked. My reply was this. I gave a sign to Hammond, and both of us, conquering our fearful repugnance to touch the invisible creature, lifted it from the ground, manacled as it was, and took it to my bed. Its weight was about that of a boy of fourteen. And now, my friends, I said, as Hammond and myself held the creature suspended over the bed, I can give you self-evident proof that here is a solid, ponderable body which nevertheless you cannot see. Be good enough to watch the surface of the bed attentively. I was astonished at my own courage in treating this strange event so calmly, but I had recovered from my first terror and felt a sort of scientific pride in the affair, which dominated every other feeling. The eyes of the bystanders were immediately fixed on my bed. At a given signal, Hammond and I let the creature fall. It was the dull sound of a heavy body alighting on a soft mass. 
the timbers of the bed creak. A deep impression marked itself distinctively on the pillow and on the bed itself. The crowd who witnessed this gave a low cry and rushed from the room. Hammond and I were left alone with our mystery. We remained silent for some time, listening to the low, irregular breathing of the creature on the bed and watching the rustle of the bedclothes as it impotently struggled to free itself from confinement. Then Hammond spoke. Terry, this is awful. Aye, awful, but not unaccountable. Not unaccountable? What do you mean? Such a thing has never occurred since the birth of the world. I know not what to think, Hammond. Good God, grant that I am not mad, and that this is not an insane fantasy. Let us reason a little, Harry. Here is a solid body which we touch, but which we cannot see. The fact is so unusual that it strikes us with terror. Is there no parallel, though, for such a phenomenon? Take a piece of pure glass. It is tangible and transparent. A certain chemical coarseness is all that prevents it, being so entirely transparent as to be totally invisible. It is not theoretically impossible, mind you, to make a glass which shall not reflect a single ray of light. A glass so pure and homogeneous in its atoms that the rays from the sun will pass through it as they do through the air, refracted but not reflected. We do not see the air, and yet we feel it. That's all very well, Hammond, but these are inanimate substances. Glass does not breathe, air does not breathe. This thing has a heart that palpitates, a will that moves it, lungs that play and inspire and respire. You forget the phenomenon of which we have so often heard of late, answered the doctor gravely. The meeting's called spirit service hands have been thrust into the hands of those persons around the table, warm, fleshy hands that seem to pulsate with mortal life. What? Do you think, then, that this thing is... I don't know what it is, was the solemn reply, but please the gods, I will, with your assistance, thoroughly investigate it. We watched together smoking many pipes all night long by the bedside of the unearthly being that tossed and panted until it apparently wearied out. Then we learned by the low, regular breathing that it slept. The next morning the house was still astir. The boarders congregated on the landing outside my room, and Hammond and myself were lions. We had to answer a thousand questions as to the state of our extraordinary prisoner, for as yet not one person in the house except ourselves could be induced to set foot in the apartment. The creature was awake. This was evidenced by the convulsive manner in which the bedclothes were moved in its efforts to escape. There was something truly terrible in the holding, as it were, those second-hand indications of the terrible writhings and agonized struggles for liberty which themselves were invisible. Hammond and myself had racked our brains during the night, the long night, discover some means by which we might realize the shape and general appearance of the enigma. As well as we could make out by passing our hands of the creature form, its outlines and lineaments were human. There was a mouth, a round, smooth head without hair, a nose, which, however, was a little elevated above the cheeks, and its hands and feet were like those of a boy. At first we thought of placing the being on a smooth surface and tracing its outlines with chalk, as shoemakers trace the outline of the foot. This plan was given up as being of no value. Such an outline would not give the slightest detail and idea of its conformation. A happy thought struck me. We could take a cast of it and blaster of Paris. This would give us some solid figure and satisfy all of our wishes. But how to do it? The movements of the creature would disturb the setting of the plastic covering and distort the mold. Another thought. Why not give it chloroform? It had respiratory organs. That was evident by its breathing. Once reduced to a state of insensibility, we 
we could do with it what we would. Dr. X was sent for, and after the worthy physician had recovered from the first shock of amazement, he proceeded to administer the chloroform. In three minutes afterward, we were enabled to remove the fetters from the creature's body, and a modeler was busily engaged in covering the invisible form with moist clay. In five minutes more, we had a mold, and before evening, a rough facsimile of the mystery. It was shaped like a man, distorted, uncouth, and horrible, but still a man. It was small, not over four feet, some inches in height, and its limbs revealed a muscular development that was unparalleled. Its face surpassed in hideousness anything I've ever seen. Gustave Doré, or Callot, or Tony Jacono never conceived anything so horrible. There is a face in one of the latter's illustrations to Un voyage où il vous plaira, which somewhat approaches the countenance of this creature does not equal it. It was the physiognomy of what I should fancy a ghoul might be. I looked as if it was capable of feeding on human flesh. Having satisfied our curiosity and bound everyone in the house to secrecy, it became a question what was to be done with our enigma. It was impossible that we should keep such a horror in our house. It was equally impossible that such an awful being should be let loose upon the world. I confess that I would have gladly voted for the creature's destruction. But who would shoulder the responsibility? Who would undertake the execution of this horrible semblance to a human being? Day after day, this question was deliberated gravely. Warders all left the house. Mrs. Moffat was in despair and threatened Hammond and myself with all sorts of legal penalties if we did not remove the horror. Our answer was, we will go if you like, but we decline taking this creature with us. Remove it yourself, if you please. It appeared in your house. On you, the responsibility rests. To this, there was, of course, no answer. Mrs. Moffat could not obtain, for love of money, a person who would even approach the mystery. At last it died. Hammond and I found it cold and stiff one morning in the bed. The heart had ceased to beat, the lungs to inspire. We hastened to bury it in the garden. It was a strange funeral, the dropping of that viewless corpse into the damp hole. The cast of its form I gave to Dr. X, who keeps it in his museum in 10th Street. As I am on the eve of a long journey from which I may not return, I've drawn up this narrative of an event the most singular that has ever come to my knowledge. I hope you enjoyed What Was It by J.S. Lefanu, as performed by yours truly. If you're familiar with the works of Mr. Lefanu, you're in good company. If you're not, allow me to shed a little light on it. Born in Ireland in the early 19th century, he rose to prominence as a writer in many genres, but most would be familiar with his darker works. Tonight we share but a taste of his prowess, and you might be interested to know that his novella, Carmilla, beat his fellow countryman, Bram Stoker, to the vampire novel by almost 30 years. If you wish to find out more about him, his works are currently available to read wherever fine horror literature can be found. Thank you for your support on this program and of tonight's featured author. You know, I've never been attacked in my sleep, but I have noticed things moving around in the house when I'm not looking. While it would be easy to ascribe it as simply the wanderings of a deranged mind, I feel much more comforted to think an invisible goblin is living in my house and could strike at any moment. Speaking of a deranged mind, is that the case with our next story? Is it perhaps merely a madness that haunts his mind? Or is the voice he hears leading him to sinister intent that is much more real than he'd like to believe? Without further ado, I present to you 
The Spirit's Whisper. Yes, I've been haunted. Haunted so fearfully that for some little time I thought myself insane. I was no raving maniac. I mixed in society as heretofore, although perhaps a trifle more grave and taciturn than usual. I pursued my daily avocations. I employed myself even on literary work. To all appearance, I was one of the sanest of the sane. And yet, all the while, I considered myself the victim of such strange delusion that in my own mind I fancied my senses, and one sense in particular, so far erratic and beyond my own control that I was, in real truth, a madman. How far I was then insane must be for others who hear my story to decide. My hallucinations have long since left me, and, at all events, I am now as sane as I suppose most men are. My first attack came on one afternoon when, being in a listless and idle mood, I had risen from my work and was amusing myself with speculating at my window on different personages who were passing before me. At that time, I occupied apartments in the Brompton Road. Perhaps there's no thoroughfare in London where the ordinary passengers are so varied a description or high life or low life mingle in so perpetual a medley. South Kensington carriages there jostle costermongers' carts, the clerk in the public office returning to his suburban dwelling, brushes the labor coming from his work on the never-ending modern constructions in the new district. And the ladies of some of the surrounding squares flaunt the most gigantic of chignons and the most exuberant of motley dresses before the envying eyes of the ragged girls with their vegetable baskets. There was, as usual, plenty of material for observation and conjecture in the passengers and their characters or destinations from my window on that day. Yet I was not in the right cue for the thorough enjoyment of my favorite amusement. I was in a rather melancholy mood. Somehow or other, I don't know why, my memory had reverted to a pretty woman whom I had not seen for many years. She had been my first love, and I had loved her with a boyish passion as genuine as it was intense. I thought my heart would have been broken, and I certainly talked seriously of dying when she formed an attachment to an ill-conditioned handsome young adventurer, and on her family objecting to such an alliance, eloped with him. I had never seen the fellow, against whom, however, I cherished a hatred almost as intense as my passion for the infatuated girl who had flown from her home for his sake. We had heard of her being on the continent with her husband, and learned that the man's shifty life had taken him to the east, For some years, nothing more had been heard of the poor girl. It was a melancholy history, and its memory ill-disposed me for amusement. A sigh was probably just escaping my lips, with the half-articulated words, Poor Julia, when my eyes fell on a man passing before my window. There was nothing particularly striking about him. He was tall, with fine features, and a long, fair beard, contrasting somewhat with his bronzed complexion. I'd seen many of our officers on their return from the Crimea look much the same. Still, the man's aspect gave me a shuddering feeling. I don't know why. At the same moment, a whispering, low voice uttered aloud in my ear the words, It is he. I turned, startled. There was no one near me, no one in the room. There was no fancy in the sound. I heard the words with painful distinctness. I ran to the door, opened it. Not a sound on the staircase. Not a sound in the whole house. Nothing but the hum from the street. I came back and sat down. It was no use reasoning with myself. I had the ineffaceable conviction that I had heard the voice. Then the first idea crossed my mind that I might be the victim of hallucinations. Yes, it must have been so. For now I recall to mind that the voice had been that of my poor lost Julia, and at the moment I heard it, I 
had been dreaming of her. A crisis of my own state of health. I was well, at least I had been so. I felt fully assured up to that moment. Now a feeling of chilliness and numbness and faintness had crept over me. A cold sweat was on my forehead. I tried to shake off this feeling by bringing back my thoughts to some other object. But involuntarily, as it were, I again uttered the words, Poor Julia, aloud. At the same time, a deep and heavy sigh, almost a groan, was distinctly audible close by me. I sprang up. I was alone, quite alone. It was, once more, an hallucination. By degrees, the first painful impression wore away. Some days had passed, and I'd begun to forget my singular delusion. When my thoughts did revert to it, the recollection was dismissed as that of a ridiculous fancy. One afternoon I was in the Strand, coming from Charing Cross, when I was once more overcome by that peculiar feeling of cold and numbness which I'd experienced before. The day was warm and bright and genial, and yet... I positively shivered. I had scarce time to interrogate my own strange sensations when a man went by me rapidly. How was it that I recognized him at once as the individual who had only passed my window so casually on the morning of the hallucination? I don't know, and yet I was aware that this man was the tall, fair passerby of the Brompton Road. At the same moment, the voice I had previously heard whispered distinctly in my ear the words, Follow him. I stood stupefied. The usual throngs of indifferent persons were hurrying past me in that crowded thoroughfare, but I felt convinced that not one of these had spoken to me. I remained transfixed for a moment. I was bent on a matter of business in the contrary direction to the individual I'd remarked, and so, although with unsteady step, I endeavored to proceed on my way. Again, that voice said, still more emphatically in my ear, follow him. I stopped involuntarily. And a third time, follow him. I told myself that the sound was a delusion, a cheat of my senses, and yet I could not resist the spell. I turned to follow him. Quickening my pace, I soon came up with the tall, fair man, and unremarked by him, I followed him. Whether this was foolish pursuit to lead me? It was useless to ask myself the question. I was impelled to follow. I was not destined to go very far, however. Before long, the object of my absurd chase entered a well-known insurance office. I stopped at the door of the establishment. I had no business with him. Why should I continue to follow? Had I not already been making a sad fool of myself by my ridiculous conduct? These were my thoughts as I stood, heated by my quick walk. Yes, heated. And yet, once more came the sudden chill. Once more that same low but awful voice spoke in my ear. Go in, it said. I endeavored to resist the spell, and yet I felt that resistance was in vain. Fortunately, as it seemed to me, the thought crossed my mind that an old acquaintance was a clerk in that same insurance office. I had not seen the fellow for a great length of time, and I never had been very intimate with him. But here was a pretext, so I went in and inquired for Clement Stanley. My acquaintance came forward. He was very busy, he said. I invented, on the spur of the moment, some excuse of the most frivolous and absurd nature, as far as I can collect, for my intrusion. By the way, I said, as I turned to take my leave, although my question was, by the way, of nothing at all, who was that tall, fair man who just now entered the office? Oh, that fellow, was the indifferent reply. A Captain Campbell, or Canton, or some such name. I forget what. He's gone in before the board, insured his wife's life, and she's dead come for the settlement, I suppose. There was nothing more to be gained, so I left the office. As soon as I came without into the scorching sunlight, I gained the same feeling of cold, I gained the same voice. Wait! Was I going mad? More and more the conviction forced itself upon me that I was decidedly 
a monomaniac already. I felt my pulse. I was agitated and yet not feverish. I was determined not to give way to this absurd hallucination, and yet, so far was I out of my senses that my will was no longer my own. Resolved as I was to go, I listened to the dictates of that voice and waited. What was it to me that this Campbell, or Canton, had ensured his wife's life, that she was dead, that he wanted a settlement of his claim? Obviously nothing, and yet I waited. So strong was the spell on me that I had no longer any count of time. I had no consciousness whether the period was long or short, that I stood there near the door, heeding of all the throng that passed, gazing on vacancy. The fiercest of policemen might have told me to move on, and I should have not stirred, in spite of all the terrors of that station. The individual came forth. He paid no heed to me. Why should he? What was I to him? This time I needed no warning voice to bid me to follow. I was a madman not resist the impulses of my madness. It was thus, at least I reasoned with myself, I followed into Regent Street. The object of my insensate observation lingered and looked around as if in expectation. Presently, a fine-looking woman, somewhat extravagantly dressed and obviously not a lady, advanced toward him on the pavement. At the sight of her, he quickened his step and joined her rapidly. I shuddered again, but this time a sort of dread was mingled in with that strange shivering. I knew what was coming, and it came. I gained that voice in my ear. Look and remember, it said. I passed the man and woman as they stopped at their first meeting. Is all right, George? said the female. All right, my girl, was the reply. I looked. An evil smile, as if a wicked triumph was on the man's face, I thought. And on the woman's? I looked at her and I remembered. I could not be mistaken. In spite of her change in manner, dress, and appearance, it was Mary Sims. This woman, some years before, when she was still very young, had been a sort of humble companion to my mother. A simple-minded, honest girl, we thought her. Sometimes I'd fancied that she had paid me in a sly way, a marked attention. I'd been foolish enough to be flattered by her stealthy glances and her sighs. But I'd treated these little demonstrations of partiality as due only to a silly, girlish fancy. Mary Sims, however, had come to grief in our household. She had been detected in the abstraction of sundry jewels and petty ornaments, the morning after discovery, she had left the house, and we had heard of her no more. As these recollections passed rapidly through my mind, I looked behind me. The couple had turned back. I turned to follow again, and, in spite of carriages and cabs and shouts and oaths of driver, I took the middle of the street in order to pass the man and woman at a little distance unobserved. No, I was not mistaken. The woman was Mary Sims though without any trace of all her former simple-minded airs. Mary Sims, no longer in her humble attire, but flaunting in all the finery of overdose fashion. She wore an air of reckless joyousness on her face, and yet in spite of that, I pitied her. It was clear she had fallen on the evil ways of better fortune, bettered her lass, for the worse. I had an excuse now, in my own mind, for my continued pursuit, without deeming myself an utter madman. The excuse of curiosity, you know, the destiny of one with whom I'd been formerly familiar, and in whom I'd taken an interest. Presently the game I was hunting down stopped at the door of the Grand Café. After a little discussion, they entered. It was a public place of entertainment. There was no reason why I should not also enter. I found my way to the first floor. They were already seated at a table, Mary holding the cart in hand. They were about to dine. Why should I not dine there, too? There was but one little objection. I had an engagement to dinner. 
a strange impulse which overpowered me and seemed leading me on step by step, spite of myself, quickly overruled all the dictates of property toward my intended hosts. Could I not send a pettily devised apology? I glided past the couple with my head averted, seeking a table, and I was unobserved by my old acquaintance. I was too agitated to eat, but I made a semblance and little heeded the air of surprise and almost disgust on the bewildered face of the waiter as he bore away the barely touched dishes. I was in a very fever of impatience and doubt what to do next. They still sat on, in evident enjoyment of their meal and their constant drafts of sparkling wine. My impatience was becoming almost unbearable when the man at last rose. The woman seemed to have uttered some expostulation, for he turned at the door and said something harshly aloud. Nonsense. Only one game, and I shall be back. The waiter will give you a paper, a magazine, something to while away the time. And he left the room for the billiard table, as I surmised. Now was my opportunity. After a little hesitation, I rose and planted myself abruptly on the vacant seat before the woman. Mary, I said. She started with a little exclamation of alarm and dropped the papers she'd held. She knew me at once. Master John, she exclaimed, using the familiar term still given me when I was long past boyhood, and then, after a lengthened gaze, she turned away her head. I was embarrassed at first how to address her. Mary, I said at last, I am grieved to see you thus. Why should you be grieved for me, she retorted, looking at me sharply and speaking in a tone of impatient anger. I am happy as I am. I don't believe you, I replied. She again turned away her head. Mary, I pursued, can you doubt that, spite of all, I still have a strong interest in the companion of my youth? She looked at me almost mournfully, but did not speak. At that moment, I probably grew pale, for suddenly that chilly fit seized me again, and my forehead became clammy. That voice sounded again in my ear. Speak of him, were the words it uttered. Mary gazed on me with surprise, and yet I was assured that she had not heard that voice so plain to me. She evidently mistook the nature of my visible emotion. Oh, Master John, she stammered, with tears gathering in her eyes, reverting again to the name of bygone times. If you had loved me then, if you had consoled my true affection with one word of hope, one look of loving kindness, if you had not spurned and crushed me, should not have been what I am now. I was about to make some answer to this burst of unforgotten passion when the voice came again. Speak of him. You have loved others since, I remarked, with a coldness which seemed cruel to myself. You love him now. And I nodded my head toward the door by which the man had disappeared. Do I? she said with a bitter smile. Perhaps. Who knows? And yet no good can come to you from a connection with that man, I pursued. Why not? He adores me and he is free, was her answer, given with a little triumphant air. Yes, I said, I know he is free. He's lately lost his wife. He's made good his claim to the sum for which he insured her life. Mary grew deadly pale. How did you learn this? What do you know of him? She stammered. I had no reply to give. She scanned my face anxiously for some time. Then, in a low voice, she added, What do you suspect? I was still silent and only looked at her fixedly. You do not speak, she pursued nervously. Why do you not speak? Ah, you know more than you would say. Master John. Master John, you might set my tortured mind at rest and clear or confirm those doubts which will come into my poor head, spite of myself. Speak out. Oh, do speak out. Not here. It's impossible, I replied, looking around. 
The room, as the hour advanced, was becoming more thronged with guests, and the full tables gave a pretext for my reticence, when in truth I had nothing to say. Will you come and see me, will you? She asked with earnest entreaty. I nodded my head. Have you a pocketbook? I will write you my address and you will come. Yes, I'm sure you will come, she said in an agitated way. I added her my pocketbook and pencil. She wrote rapidly. Between the hours of three and five, she whispered, looking uneasily at the door. She was sure not to be at home. I rose. Mary held out her hand to me, then withdrew it hastily with an air of shame. The tears sprang into her eyes again. I left the room hurriedly and met her companion on the stairs. That same evening, in the solitude of my own room, I pondered over the little event of the day. I had calmed down from my state of excitement. Living apparition of Mary Sims occupied my mind almost to the exclusion of the terrors of ghostly voice which had haunted me, and my own fears coming insanity. In truth, what was that man to me? Nothing. What did his doings matter to such a perfect stranger as myself? Nothing. His connection with Mary Sims was our only link, and in what should that affect me? Nothing again. I debated with myself whether it were not foolish of me to comply with my youthful companion's request to visit her, whether it were not imprudent in me to take any further interest in the lost woman, whether there were not even danger in seeking to penetrate mysteries which were no concern of mine. The resolution to which I came pleased me, and I said aloud, No, I will not go. At the same moment came then again the voice, like an awful echo to my words, Go! It came so suddenly, and so imperatively, almost without any previous warning, as the usual shudder, that the shock was more than I could bear. I believe I fainted. I know I found myself, when I came to consciousness, in my armchair, cold and numb, and my candles had almost burned down to their sockets. The next morning I was really ill. A sort of low fever seemed to have prostrated me, and I would have willingly seized so valid a reason for disobeying, at least for that day, for some days, perhaps, the injunction of that ghostly voice. But all that morning it never left me. My fearful, chilly fit was of the constant recurrence, and the words, go, 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 were murmured so perpetually in my ears. The sound was one of such urgent entreaty that all force of will gave way completely. Had I remained in that lone room, I should have gone wholly mad. As yet, to my own feelings, I was but partially out of my senses. I dressed hastily, and I scared no how. By no effort of my own will, it seemed to me I was in the open air. The address of Mary Sims was in a street not far from my own suburb. Without any power of reasoning, I found myself before the door of the house. I knocked and asked a slipshod girl who opened the door to me for Miss Sims. She knew no such person held a brief, shrill colloquy with some female in the back parlor, and on coming back was about to shut the door in my face, when a voice from above, the voice of her I saw it, called down the stairs, let the gentleman come up. I was allowed to pass. In the front drawing room I found Mary Sims. They do not know me under that name, she said with a mournful smile, and again extended, then withdrew her hand. Sit down, she went on to say after a nervous pause. I am alone now. I tell, I adjure you, if you have still one lament feeling of old kindness for me, explain your words of yesterday to me. I muttered something to the effect that I had no explanation to give. No words could be truer. I had not the slightest conception what to say. Yes, I am sure you have. You must, you will, pursued Mary excitedly. You have some knowledge of that matter. 
What matter? I asked. Why, the insurance, she replied impatiently. You know well what I mean. My mind has been distracted about it. In spite of myself, terrible suspicions have forced themselves on me. No, I don't mean that, she cried, suddenly checking herself and changing her tone. Don't heed what I said. It was madness in me to say what I did. But do, 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 do tell me what all you know. The request was a difficult one to comply with, for I knew nothing. It's impossible to say what might have been the end of this strange interview, in which I began to feel myself an unwilling impostor. But suddenly Mary started. The noise of the latch key in the lock, she cried, alarmed. He's returned. He must not see you. You must come another time. Here, here, be quick. I'll manage him. And before I could utter another word, she had pushed me into the back drawing room and closed the door. A man stepped on the stairs, then voices. The man was begging Mary to come out with him, as the day was so fine. She excused herself. He would hear no refusal. At last, she appeared to consent, on condition that the man would assist her to the toilet. There was a little laughter, almost hysterical on the part of Mary, whose voice evidently quivered with trepidation. Presently, both mounted the upper stairs. Then the thought stuck me that I'd left my hat in the front room, sufficient cause for the woman's alarm. I opened the door cautiously, seized my hat, and was about to steal down the stairs when I was again spellbound by that numb cold. Stay, said the voice. I staggered back to the other room with my hat and closed the door. Presently the couple came down. Mary was probably relieved by discovering that my hat was no longer there and surmised I'd departed, for I heard her laughing as they went down the lower flight, and I heard them leave the house. I was alone in that back drawing room. Why? What did I want there? I was soon to learn. I felt the chill, invisible presence near me, and the voice said, Search! The room belonged to the common representative class of back drawing rooms in apartments of the better kind. Only one unfamiliar piece of furniture was an old Indian cabinet, and my eye naturally fell on that. As I stood and looked at it with a strange, uncomfortable feeling of fascination, again came the voice, Search! I shuddered and obeyed. The cabinet was firmly locked. There was no power of opening it, except by burglarious infraction. But the voice still said, Search! A thought suddenly struck me, and I turned the cabinet from its position against the wall. Behind, the woodwork had rotted and in many portions fallen away, so that the inner drawers were visible. What could my ghostly monitor mean? That I should open these drawers? I would not do such a deed of petty treachery. I turned defiantly and, addressing myself to the invisible, as if it were a living creature by my side, I cried, I must not, will not, do such an act of baseness. The voice replied, Search! I might have known that, in my state of what I deemed insanity, resistance was in vain. I grasped the most accessible drawer from behind and pulled it toward me. Uppermost within it lay letters. They were addressed to Captain Cameron. Captain George Cameron. That name. The name of Julia's husband. The man with whom she'd eloped. For it was he who was the object of my pursuit. My shuddering fit became so strong that I could scarce hold the papers, and search was repeated in my ear. Below the letters lay a small book and a limp black cover. I opened this book with trembling hand, and it was filled with manuscript. Julia's well-known handwriting. Read, muttered the voice. I read. There were long entries by poor Julia of her daily life. Complaints of her husband's unkindness, neglect, and cruelty. I turned to the last pages. Her hand had grown very feeble now, and she was very ill. George seems kinder now, she he brings me all my medicines with his own hand. Later on, I'm dying. I know I'm dying. He's poisoned me. 
I saw him last night through the curtains pour something in my cup. I saw it in his evil eye. I would not drink. I will not drink no more. But I feel that I must die. These were the last words. Below were written in a man's bold hand the words, Poor fool. This sudden revelation of poor Julia's death and dying thoughts unnerved me quite. I grew colder in my whole frame than ever. Take it, said her voice. I took the book, pushed back the cabinet into its place against the wall, and, leaving that fearful room, stole down the stairs with trembling limbs and left the house with all the feelings of a guilty thief. For some days I pursued my poor lost Julia's diary again and again. The whole revelation of her sad life and sudden death led but to one conclusion. She had died of poison by the hands of her unworthy husband. He had ensured her life then. It seemed evident to me that Harry Sims had vaguely shared suspicions of the same foul deed. On my own mind came conviction. What could I do next? How bring this evil man to justice? What proof would be deemed to exist in those writings? I was bewildered, weak, irresolute. Like Hamlet, I shrank back and temporized. But I was not feigning madness. My madness seemed but all too real for me. During all this period, the wailing of that wretched voice in my ear was almost incessant. Oh, I must have been mad. I wandered about restlessly like the haunted thing I'd become. One day I had come, unconsciously and without purpose, into Oxford Street. My troubled thoughts were suddenly broken in upon by the solicitations of a beggar. With a heart hardened against begging impostors and under the influence of the shock rudely given by my absorbing dreams, I answered more heartily than was my wont. The man heaved a heavy sigh and sobbed forth. Did heaven help me? I caught sight of him before he turned away. It was a ghastly object, with fever in his hollowed eyes and sunken cheeks, and fever on his dry, chapped lips. But I knew, or fancied I knew, tricks of the trade, and I was obdurate. Why, I asked myself, should the cold shoulder come over me at such a moment? But it was so strong on me as to make me shiver all over. It came, that maddening voice. Sucre, it said now. i become so accustomed already to address the ghastly voice that I cried aloud. Why, Julia, why? I saw people laughing in my face at this strange cry, and I turned in the direction in which the beggar had gone. I just caught sight of him as he was tottering down a street towards Soho. I determined to have pity for this once, and followed the poor man. He led me on through I know not what streets. The steps were hurried now. In one street I lost sight of him, but I was felt convinced he must have turned into a dingy court. I made inquiries, but for a time received only rude, jeering answers from the rough men and women whom I questioned. At last the little girl informed me that I must mean the strange man who lodged in the garret of a house she pointed out to me. It was an old dilapidated building, and I had much repugnance on entering it. Again, I was no master of my own will. I mounted some creaking stairs to the top of the house until I could go no further. A shattered door was open. I entered a wretched garret. The object of my search lay now on a bundle of rags on the bare floor. He opened his wild eyes as I approached. I've come to succor, I said, using unconsciously the word of the voice. What ails you? Ails me, gasped the man. Hunger, starvation, fever. I was horrified. Hurrying to the top of the stairs, I shouted till I roused the attention of an old woman. I gave her money to bring me food and brandy, promising her a recompense for her trouble. Have you no friends? I asked the wretched man as I returned. None, he said feebly. Then, as the fever rose in his eyes and even flushed his pallid face, he said excitedly, I had a master once. 
one I periled my soul for. He knows I'm dying, but in spite of all my letters, he will not come. He wants me dead. He wants me dead, and his wish is coming to pass now. Cannot I find him? Bring him here, I ask. The man stared at me, shook his head, and at last, as if collecting his faculties with much exertion, muttered, Yes, it is a last hope. Perhaps you may, and I can be revenged on him at least. Yes, revenged. I've threatened him already. And the fellow laughed, a wild laugh. Control yourself, I urged, kneeling by his side. Give me his name, his address. Captain George Cameron, he gasped, and then fell back. Captain George Cameron, I cried. Speak, what of him? But the man's senses seemed gone. He only muttered incoherently. The old woman returned with food and spirits. I'd found one honest creature in that foul region. I gave her money, provide her more if she would bring a doctor. She departed on her new errand. I raised the man's head, moistened his lips with the brandy, and then poured some of the spirit down his throat. He gulped at it eagerly and opened his eyes, but he still raved incoherently. I did not do it. It was he. He made me buy the poison. He dared not risk the danger of it, the coward. I knew what he meant to do with it, and yet I did not speak. I was her murderer, too. Poor Mrs. Cameron. Poor Mrs. Cameron, do you forgive me? Can you forgive? The man screamed aloud and stretched out his arms as if to fright away a phantom. I had drunk in every word and knew the meaning of those broken accents well. Could I have found at least the means of bringing justice on the murderer's head? But the man was raving in a delirium, and I was obliged to hold him with all my strength. A step on the stairs. Could it be the medical man I'd sent for? That, indeed, would be a blessing. A man entered. It was Cameron. He came in jauntily with the words, How now, Sanders, you rascal? What more do you want to get out of me? He started at the sight of the stranger. I rose from my kneeling posture like an accusing spirit. I struggled for calm, but passion beyond my control mastered me, and was I not a madman? I seized him by the throat with more words. Murderer! Poisoner! Where's Julia? He shut me off violently. And who the devil are you, sir? He cried. That murdered woman's cousin. I rushed at him again. Lying hound, he shouted and grappled me. His strength was far beyond mine. He had his hand on my throat. A crimson darkness was in my eyes. I could not see. I could not hear. There was a torrent of sound pouring in my ears. Suddenly his grasp relaxed. When I recovered my sight, I saw the murderer struggling with the fever-stricken man who had risen from the floor and seized him from behind. This unexpected diversion saved my life, but the ex-groom was soon thrown back on the ground. Captain George Cameron, I cried. Kill me, but you will only heap another murder on your head. He advanced toward me with something glittering in his hand. Without a word, he came and stabbed at me. But at that same moment, I darted at him a heavy blow. What followed was too confused for clear remembrance. I saw, no, I will say I fancied that I saw, the dim form of Julia Stanton standing between me and her vile husband. Did he see the vision, too? I cannot say. He reeled back and fell heavily to the floor. Maybe it was only my blow that felled him. Then came confusion. A dream of a crowd of people, policemen, muttered accusations. I had fainted from the wound in my arm. Captain George Cameron was arrested. Saunders recovered and lived long enough to be the principal witness on his trial. The murderer was found guilty. Poor Julia's diary, too, which I had abstracted, flowed fearfully against him. But he contrived to escape the gallows. He had managed to conceal poison on his person, and he was found dead in his cell. 
Mary Sims, I never saw again. I once received a little scrawl. I'm at peace now, Master John. God bless you. I've had no more hallucinations since that time. The voice has never come again. I found out poor Julia's grave, and as I stood and wept by its side, the cold shoulder came over me for the last time. Who shall tell me whether I was once really mad or whether I was not? I hope you enjoyed The Spirit's Whisper by J.S. Lathanu, as performed by yours truly. If you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author is indeed dead, and has been for quite some time. This is very important to remember, because nothing wondrous of what might follow will... Whoa, wait, wrong author. But if you've enjoyed his works, please know he can be found in many fine collections of horror. And though we did not hear it tonight, his work, Camilla has been adapted onto other media. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured off. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month. Get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. Subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep. <laughs> if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jivey Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. 
You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and add free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>